One would be forgiven for thinking that climate activists would be overwhelmingly on board with the low emissions, clean, reliable energy that is nuclear. It would keep the lights on, it would save the planet and it would unite the left and right, at least on this issue. But for some reason, woke countries like Germany, like here, well, Germany shutting down its nuclear plants, here we refuse to do it. Uh, this all at the same time when Russia is holding European energy supply to ransom and the cost of power is soaring globally. But something, this wicked, something wicked this way comes. Joining us now is British author and former Extinction Rebellion UK spokesperson who has seen, yes, the light, forgive the pun, <laughs> Zion Lights. Great to have you back here on Outsiders. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks, apart from our energy crisis. Well, the energy crisis, if anyone can solve it, you can. You first appeared on this show before anywhere else in Australia, and I'm delighted to say you are coming to Australia in a couple of weeks' time for CPAC. Uh, CPAC is, uh, you know, people should buy their tickets now because the opportunity to hear you speak, uh, along with so many other people, uh, Michael Schellenberger, you've got Tony Abbott, Jacinta Price, Warren Mundine, Nigel Farage, of course. So great line-up there. And, Zion, it's terrific that you are part of that lineup, uh, because here on this show a few months ago, you challenged uh, Chris Bowen to a debate, our uh, energy minister. He shirked that one entirely, which is not a surprise. But just have a listen to him and his reaction to nuclear energy. Have a listen. Seriously, a couple of points. Nine years in office, and then coming up with bright ideas on the on the other side of the election. Point one, no credibility. Point two, nuclear is the most expensive form of energy. We have a cost of living crisis, energy prices going through the roof, and what's their big bright idea? They say, let's, let's have the most expensive form of energy we can possibly think of. Let's come up with the most expensive form of energy and let's put that in the system because that's going to make power prices cheaper. They want that debate? They really want to argue that? Bring it on. It's, a, it's a, just a complete joke. So let's bring it on, Zion. Apart from teaching him how to pronounce the word nuclear, you can, probably, <laughs> you can probably also teach him much more. So fire away. Given the opportunity, what you would say to Mr Bowen there? Well, first of all, nuclear is not the most expensive source of energy. Um, in fact, there's an international energy agency report. It's a very comprehensive report. It's just math. It's just numbers. You can have a look at it, and it basically shows that nuclear is the cheapest energy source. I know that's uh, big news to everybody because there's this constant myth that it's the most expensive. But actually, yes, the upfront costs are expensive, but then these power plants run for so long um, and because they provide baseload power, so firm power, and they aren't intermittent, they're actually, you know, you don't have to factor in a baseload cost of, you know, renewables, for example, needing fossil fuel backup if there's no nuclear available. So they, it actually is very, very cheap. Um, and it's also cheaper to the consumer. So before the um, current um, Russian invasion of Ukraine in Europe, the cheapest electricity to consumer was in France. And France has the highest, um, one of the highest nuclear mixes, one of the highest amounts of nuclear in its energy mix. Um, so also, you know, it's very expensive to us now. We're, as you probably know, we're in an energy crisis. It's impacting all of Europe. Um, some some places are very fortunate and they, they have a lot of um, hydro and nuclear, for example, Finland and Sweden, but even they are feeling the pressure because, you know, they're having to export more to other countries and there's an energy deficit. Like, we just can't produce enough. Um, and yes, it's great. Germany built lots of renewables. Um, as I understand, so has South Australia done this. And that, you know, when that's at full generation, then you have a lot of power, but you still... I think that at, at the most in South Australia, it's about 60%. That, that's great. But the rest still has to come from somewhere. Otherwise, your lights go off and your fridges don't work and is you it, can't charge your mobile phone. Zan, is there a way we can get to net zero without completely decimating our lifestyles and living standards without nuclear? There is no way of doing it without nuclear. There is just no way. I mean, there, there's no research to support it, uh, no credible research. Um, there is some research by a Stanford professor who um, his research had to be retracted because his numbers were wrong. Mm. And then he started trying to sue. Do you know about this case? And he started suing the the scientists, the 21 scientists, Smart Jacobson. He, um, yeah, anyway, he fudged the numbers. They found that he was wrong. He tried to sue them. And now he's having to pay 
money because his defamation uh, suit was thrown out. It's it's a big palaver, but unfortunately, he is cited as the number one source of uh, scientists Jeez. that has proved proven that we can reach 100% renewables. So this is all you know very well documented. If you if you look him up, there's a lot of research on it, and you can go to Retraction Watch, and it's on there too. But unfortunately, it's just the myth that just keeps spreading. It just keeps it's so pervasive. People just repeat it. You see Chris Bowne repeating it and repeating it. It's just not true, and it, you've got you do have to learn from our mistakes. I mean. Look, Britain, okay, Britain is building nuclear power stations now, but it takes us a long time. It shouldn't take a long time. You can build new reactors in three years. Japan has done it. Uh, Switzerland has done it three years. So in 10 years, you could build enough reactors to decarbonize like it's so you can, and maintain mm. your quality of life. Absolutely. And then have cheap, abundant energy for other um, needs that might come along along the way. You know, look at our use of laptops and, and phones now and... We often need more energy. So you still hear these old arguments, use less energy. Yet you can do that in your personal lifestyle. I've done that for a long time. But realistically, the world continues to use more. And as more people are lifted out of poverty, which we should be glad about, they need more energy. So let's just make sure it's clean. It's better for air pollution. It doesn't drive climate change. That's all we're saying. In Britain, the reason it takes a long time is because we don't have any industry. So uh, this is this is where Australia is really lucky. You have a lot of coal by power station, so you have a lot of workers, actually a lot of trained workers. We have a deficit of engineers and welders and builders. So yeah, okay, we're, we're encouraging that that now. We need those workers. We're getting them working on the power stations, but it takes a long time to put that in place. Whereas you are ready to go with the transition, like so ready to go. There's even, uh, I don't know if you saw the Department of Energy report that the US just released. Um, it was just a few days ago where they looked at all the coal fire power stations in the US, including ones that had been shut down, and they found 80% of them would be perfect sites for nuclear power plants. Like wow, it's that that's easy. interesting. You James. Have, they have the workers as well. It's a really good, again, comprehensive report. I urge and, people but, to look at look at the data. But Zion, we spoke about, a bit before about, you know, the maintenance of modern 21st century consumer lifestyles. I get the sense from listening to an awful lot of people who are Greens or have mm. that green-tinged uh, politics that they actually see a broad-based, prosperous middle class as problematic <laughs> and that they actually don't want people to have the freedom, the independence, the liberty that goes along with having cheap energy for a variety of reasons, whether they're aesthetic or political or what have you. Do you think that some of that is driving the opposition to nuclear power in places like Australia? I think there is some of that. I mean, the, it's, it's ironic, of course, because the green movement, the environmental movement, is a very middle-class advantaged kind of movement. And then they're saying, we don't want other people to have these lifestyles or we messed up in having these lifestyles, even though we've, we've uh, experienced the benefits, you know, and all of the, the things mm. that come along with having a lot of energy. Um, there is some of that. Some of it is just still very irrational fear. And I find that sometimes having the conversations will shift people's minds because, because uh, you know, they fear things like radiation and waste. These are old fears that are quite easy to displace now if you talk about fossil fuels and impacts of fossil fuels because a lot of people understand that. So there's, you know, there's different reasons. But ultimately, I think, you know, I think even when you see um, politicians talking, you can see there's quite a lot of fear there. Like they're having almost like they, they're getting really upset and taking it personally. And I... I often say, you know, we're just talking about data here. Like, you can go and look at the reports, but don't make the mistakes of what we have done in Europe. Like, we're realizing now, but now we've got to get through the winter. Now, we're talking about, can we get through the winter? I mean, if you're looking, look at what's happened in Germany. They phased out the nuclear power plants. They, they got worried in 2011 because of the Fukushima Daiichi power plant meltdown. Even though no one was killed by that meltdown, they worried about it. Even though they're not going to have a tsunami uh, or major earthquake in Germany, they're worried about it. They had an irrational fear response. They phased out all of their nuclear. So they've got three um, power stations left. And what's really interesting is that recent polls show that the German public have massively shifted in favor now of nuclear and keeping those power stations open. But the government there is still saying, no, what we'll do is we'll restart the coal, the mothboard coal power stations, but we won't reopen nuclear. And it's totally bizarre because it's A, against what people want, and B, they are, they are, you know, they are struggling. They're annoying their European neighbors because of this energy deficit. I mean, they are struggling to get to the winter. They're talking about not having enough firewood to get through the winter. That's how bad it is. So it's bad in the UK, but it's not as bad as that, at least not yet. But again, you know, um, we, we haven't made good decisions on nuclear. And we, the, the ambitions that Germany had to reach 100% renewables um, 
by 2050 or whatever it was, they've dropped that now. They, they, they've, they've lost their coal target. They were supposed to phase coal, coal out in the next few years, and they're reopening coal power, fire sta coal fire power stations. And in Britain, we're talking about restarting fracking. You know, I'm not, not a fan of fracking, but I also don't want people to freeze in their homes. And frankly, we're importing it anyway. We're importing the gas anyway. We need something until we get nuclear built here. Don't do what Germany has done. So I've seen that th there are ambitions in South Australia to have 500% renewables by 2050. Look, I'm all for ambition. If you're talking about raising child literacy rates or getting people to the moon, I think it's great. I think nations do incredible things when they're ambitious, but you've got to be realistic too. Like you've got to look at the numbers and say, does it add up or doesn't it? It didn't work in Germany and now they're in dire straits. And at some point, I think that politicians are going to have to recognize that and make different decisions. It, it won't work anywhere else. It's never, no large grid in the entire world has ever been decarbonized only using renewables. Even when Absolutely. there's huge amounts of hydropower in places where there is a lot of hydropower available, like Sweden and Finland, even then they need nuclear to fill the, fill the, the energy needs that are left. Zion Light's always fantastic. A voice of reason and common sense. And I will remind our viewers that uh, Zion was a leading member of Extinction Rebellion. Climate change is a passionate belief of hers, yet you hear from her common sense based on data. And that's why I urge people to bring young climate change concerned kids to listen to Zion Light speak because she is literally a light in the darkness on this issue.